Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Rico from Source Find Asia and the Made in China podcast. I hope you're having a productive week. Uh, this week's episode is a little bit different from what we usually do. You know, we normally talk, we do talk about lifestyle in China, but we've definitely had a focus on business, um, predominantly manufacturing, you know, crowdfunding campaigns, sourcing, that kind of stuff. But this week, sat down with Mike, just me and Mike, just the two of us. And, uh, you know, Mike's had a long history with basketball in China, what is called wild ball. So I just wanted to sit down, pick his brain, kind of get some of the crazy stories and just how he got into that. Like, you know, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but basketball is pretty big in China. Um, even as an amateur basketball player, you could probably make a decent amount of money as a nice little side hustle. So and of course, if you love the game, then, you know, that's just going to be beneficial for you. Another note that I wanted to make is this week, the outro song is not going to be on Spotify. Why? Because it's actually a new song from an obscure DJ based in, in Zambia, Southern Africa. His name is Zane Bassflex. That's Z-E-I-N-B-A-S-S-F-L-E-X. I actually don't know the name of a song, but it's a very, very obscure song. But I really, I heard it and I fell in love with it. And I downloaded it. So if you guys want that song, you can contact me directly at info at Source Find Asia and you or come to the website and send us an email through the website. So without further ado, I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. <laughs> Taking notes, I'm talking about basketball, so you, you should start furiously thinking. writing notes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about just as, as far as the podcast goes. You know, we mostly focus on business, mostly focus on on sourcing online services, FBA, these type of things. Um, but being abroad so long, living in China so long, we're also uh, we also get a chance to experience, you know, a very different life and very different culture out here. And a big part of my seven years in, in China has been um, basketball. I grew up playing basketball. It's kind of one of the things that I think defines me. I started playing in middle school. You know, for those of you who aren't interested in basketball, it's going to be really boring. Maybe not. We'll see. But, um, yeah, I came up playing ball, started in middle school, uh, played AAU basketball when I was a kid. If, if that's like year round, um, summer ball basically in, in the U.S., I don't know if they do it in Canada or not. It's a amateur athletic union, played high school. I think they do. Really? Yeah. Ah, Canada coming up. Um, played high school, played college ball. But anyway, uh, by the time I came out to China, I was, um, I was still a student. I was in a foreign exchange student, and um, I was still playing ball every day. I just came from University of Florida, where basketball was a significant part of my day. So uh, when I came out here, I still wanted to stay in shape, still wanted to play. And, um, you know, one thing I, I was aware of very, very quickly is that Chinese people love basketball. Basketball is probably the most popular sport out here um, people are basketball crazy NBA games every day on the TV uh, one of the better at least money wise better leagues in the world is the Chinese Basketball Association the CBA and um, you know you can go pretty much anywhere in China and there's basketball hoops up and a massive amount of people playing on the daily when you first got here how did you get in integrated into the basketball scene um i just went to the courts and i went to the outdoor courts uh i was going to school so there were courts by the school and then there's a gigantic area in guangzhou called uh Tianha sports center it's right smack dab in the middle of the city and it's a huge sporting complex and they have about 30 outdoor basketball courts where 
just about every day of the year, you can find every single court packed with people with about three or four downs on each court playing half court basketball, which is, you know, if you, if you're coming from the States or anywhere that that's like amazing how, how many people are playing the, the level isn't always good, but, um, you know, the, the desire and the passion for, for ball is there. So that's, that's how I got started. You know, I just would go to the outdoor courts, meet people, play, um, even to today when, when Chinese people see a foreigner that might look like they can play a little bit, they usually ask, ask you to play. So, so that's cool. It's not like the States or if you don't know anybody, you might not get on forever. I think we talked about that. Um, I don't know which podcast that was, but like I was talking about how I just came from playing football. Ah, right, right, right. And then, and then, you know, they're trying to get me to play with them and shit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, initially, how many f- were there weren't that many foreigners in in in, in Guangzhou that tempered or like no but um you know the first week I got here I, I I was hitting hitting the basketball courts every day and at both of those courts that I was talking about there was other foreigners there was other foreign exchange students and then there were foreigners who had lived here for a while and you know that's kind of a consistent of the expat community is is sports and organizing sport games how, so how different is the like for example, the foreigners that you met that time period playing basketball versus yeah. now, if you went to the courts, like are they different people? It's still kind of like the same crowd. I can't oh, imagine man. it's the same crowd. I'd say there's about whew, man. There's there's only about ten to twenty people in total that I still know yeah. in China. You know, let alone from basketball. But oddly enough, I'd say about five of them I've met. In the first year to two years I was here that are still out here and still still around and you know active in in, in the basketball scene but I mean like the the type of people the type oh of people. yeah I mean initially teachers and um, you're doing trim mm-hmm. whereas now you meet you know people from the American Chamber of Commerce you meet there's a lot of models in Guangzhou that's a big thing it's like the circling model population uh now you know which i'll get to in 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 part because of me other basketball players um you meet all kinds of people people coming in for the uh canton fair you meet all all kinds of different foreigners talk a little bit about your first tournaments okay so i mean this initially i was just playing on the courts and uh outside pick up ball and eventually like the the university team asked me to come practice with them and then some of the better people from the outdoor courts started to recognize me and I'd go to like these indoor uh, closed games where people would rent a court and we'd play against each other but the first time I went to like um, a tournament and eventually I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I, I grew to know as, as wild ball in, in China um, one of my buddies told me, hey, you know, we have a game. We got this game in this other other city. It's in Foshan, which Foshan is like an hour drive from Guangzhou. You know, would you want to play? And I said, yeah, man, that would be great. So he picks me up in this bus with like eight other players outside of uh, kind of the outskirts of Guangzhou. And we start driving. And I recognize we're driving through Foshan. All of a sudden, we've been driving in this little bus for about two and a half hours and it's nighttime we're in the middle of nowhere i've never done this before so i'm freaking out i don't speak chinese at the time so i'm just like what is going on we're driving and driving and there's nothing and there's nothing and there's nothing and eventually about three hours in we start to see some signs of life and this little little town and we start to drive through the town, and you, I start seeing lights, and then I start to notice there's cars, and cars, and there's cars lining every single one of these small streets. And eventually, we pull up to this basketball court in the middle of this little village, and there's gigantic lights outside the court, and probably about, I would say, about 10,000 people outside this outdoor basketball court. So we pull up, and at this time I'm, you know, fresh from from the states. I'd only been in China like six months, and like crazy long, curly hair, and just just looked kind of out there. And they had to have police come and escort us on the court because there were so many people. 
and the second I stepped on the court, I think I was the only foreigner that had ever stepped foot in this little village, and just the whole crowd just goes, wow, and everybody starts snapping pictures of me, and it was, it was, it was really weird, man, that was my first experience, now that's, that's the most normal thing, it's nothing, I've, I've seen it a hundred times, but at the time, it was, it was crazy, man, I've never had that much attention, and you know, to be out in the absolute middle of nowhere. I'm the only foreigner. I spoke no Chinese and there's so many people just on top of the court and it was it was it was wild. It was really, really crazy. No, you're addicted. Yeah, now now that's that's nothing. I've I've been to crazier places. I've been to outdoor courts and in, in worse conditions with five not five times, but at least three times the amount of people so yeah i've I've seen it all now you go back to the states like where are all the people where are the people taking pictures of me yeah right. where is my entourage I need my agent <laughs> um and then initially you were just playing for free right for fun yeah well i mean i had to learn the hard way um because when you go to these games and they set up these tournaments um you know it, there's always money involved there's either like a rich boss that's uh, sponsoring the game or it's a village-sponsored game. Um, majority of the time, each team's putting up money for each individual player or you'll have a situation where the top three teams place and, and make money off the games. But initially, I didn't know that. So, you know, these guys saw that I didn't know that arranged some type of price with the boss for my services and i went out for you know a shoot around with my friends and somebody's pocketing my money so i had to learn learn that way but yeah eventually how did you find out um just through talking to people learning chinese uh meeting other foreigners who were playing in and around uh china it just it just took time you know more repetition seeing what was going on kind of paying more attention you know at first that first game i was just like shell shocked you know i couldn't even focus on anything I, I couldn't even dribble i think i scored two points the whole game i was just this is crazy but then eventually you, you you sink in you get more comfortable and you start to pay attention to your surroundings and see what's see what's happening around you and you know i realized that you know this is this is a business so if i'm if i'm a new guy from the states and you know i played basketball like let's say college but i wasn't the best or just average could i still play now in, in china or how yeah i mean there's so many different games out here that's the thing that's that's a great part about china is there's just so many opportunities there's so many different types of games that uh we get our hands on out here you know these tiny little village games um we play big tournaments arranged by huge sponsors like red bull in big big cities um there's like a circuit where the top leagues in china the cba and then the second league is the nbl they um you know in their preseason they'll they'll arrange these big exhibition games so you know foreign teams will come and play against them so there's there's all kinds of different opportunities in different places in china for different levels of pay as uh as an alternative to teaching english could could somebody come here and play basketball if they're good yes um but you, you in china china's tough man it's um it's not for everybody it's not for everybody some of the stuff you have to deal with um the nonsense the the business nonsense the um basketball nonsense and the oftentimes the conditions of how and where you're playing um it takes a lot of patience uh, initially i didn't have that i lost my cool a lot i couldn't handle the, the terrible referees and the way that the chinese people play is oftentimes extremely frustrating um I'm from Chicago. I'm used to a very physical brand of basketball, and in China, they I don't I don't know how to explain. Like, um, kind of like in 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 football, in soccer. You know, there's some teams out there that you know you get anywhere near them, and they just dive on the floor and start writhing in pain f from from you, you know, scraping they against do, them. They do a lot of play acting. Oh my God, it's the worst. Ah! And and. But the referees out here, they give it to them because they're used to that brand of basketball. Mm -hmm. I mean, as well, I think it's also the stability aspect because if you're playing basketball, you're going to be traveling all the time. You're not really going to have time to... Because when I'm talking about 
as an alternative to teaching English, I'm talking about the people that want to teach English and, and start something here, like start a company or do some sort of business. Oh, uh, yeah. As a part-time gig, it's hard. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to find something stable. Um, some guys do it. Some guys are out here full-time playing. Um, but there's other options. You know, you can – there's op- a lot of options to, to teach, to teach basketball and hold, you know, camps and have private tutoring lessons. And, and if you can do that along with um, getting wild ball games, it's, it's, it's possible. But what's happened is a lot of people have recognized this opportunity. So now you have probably 30 to 40 people out here on the regular, and then you have an additional 30 to 40 people who are regularly circling in and out of China playing. So it's becoming more and more hard. And there's not as much money being thrown at this, these games as there was uh, three, four years ago. Okay. What? How did you evolve and how did you grow in in, in, in the basketball thing? Uh, I would say the first step was I started to get more patient. Like I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't blowing up as much, and just you know, just appreciated it for what it was, being able to play basketball and make some money and have some have some fun out here. Um, and I always play hard. I always have a, a reputation to always play hard, no matter who I'm playing against, what type of game it is. And then about, I would say about a year and a half ago, I got asked to play in a tournament in the middle of China. And it was a really, really strong tournament. We didn't do too well. We, we, we lost a game that we were supposed to win, but, um, the boss of the team thought, I was a good player and he liked me. And then last year, about this time, I got a call from him to put together a team for another tournament that they were having in this city. And it was a really uh, big, huge tournament for, for, for wild ball standards. Um, there are 16 teams and, you know, a lot of times they put a cap on how many foreigners they'll allow play. You know, they want the locals to play. They want Chinese people. But this tournament was no cap on how many foreigners could play. So he asked me to put together a team and, um, you know, all the best foreigners in China were there, all of them, as well as some of these other Chinese agents brought in foreigners from the States and Africa and other places. So it was a really, really big tournament, really high level basketball. It's probably the best basketball I've played in China. And um, we won. We won. And, And it was really, really tough hard games and we came out on top and and from there i've kind of had a reputation in in china as you know somewhat of an agent like a guy who who has the ability to get really high level guys to come play in these games how do the chinese agents uh like get players from the states how do they even start to build those kind of relationships well, you got a couple different type of agents. You have guys like me who live out in China and, you know, have a lot of relationships, are known for basketball, and they speak some English, and they're in the basketball scene, so they know people. Uh, but then you have another another brand of agent who um, they've recognized that they can make a lot of money off this, and they also recognize that, the you know, in the U.S., there's a, t- a huge talent pool. And also a ton of people who can easily be sold a dream. So what these guys started doing was they would pick up tournaments for a two-month stretch, month or two stretch. They would go to the USA and through usually through another agent or another coach in the States would be introduced to basketball players and tell them, hey, you know, I got I got these games out here in China for you. I'll pay for everything. You come out. I'll pay you, you know, 500 bucks for the month and you'll have the opportunity to, to be seen by all these top level teams, all these CBA teams, you know. So basically, they're just selling these guys dreams to, to play professional basketball, paying them dirt and cycling them out to China to all these little small villages where, you know, you bring five Americans out there just smack teams and they're getting these big bonuses and not paying the Americans anything. Yeah, and these agents are, they're, they're, they've become pretty famous. They actually uh, made national news in China and in USA last year. You can Google it, Iverson um, Iverson in China or like Iverson trip to China goes bad through Chinese agents. You know, those are the 
those are the top two agents in 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 China, and they're um, we're talking about forging wire transfer documents. Man. Yeah, million dollar wire transfer, forging it. You know, threatening to commit suicide if Alan Iverson didn't didn't play in the game. It's just it's a really interesting read, and you should check it out. And these are guys that you know I deal with constantly out here. So the uh, the name Wild Ball is extremely appropriate. So what 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 are red flags if you were to run into uh, one of these sleazy agent types? Um, well, I mean, my red flags are different now because I know the game and I've been out here. So these guys, you know, when, when they first met me, they were contacting me every day. You know, we need to work together, this and that. But then when they found out who I was, they don't they don't even step near me anymore because they know that I know the game. Um you know, anybody telling you that you're going to get a, a CBA contract is 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 tough unless you're going directly to work out for the CBA team. CBA is huge, man. They only take guys that have played in the NBA or have, have had huge contracts in Europe. So that's one red flag there. As far as like in China red flags, you know, people that want to pay you after you've played all the games or, um, you know, people that... that aren't holding up to to what they say oh i'll do it later i'll do it later so that, that that happens all the time you know we've had guys that have gone two weeks playing all these games all over the place being carted to this city to that city on the promise that once they're done they'll be paid and then at the end of the road they don't they don't see a dime so it's a it's a shady shady business you know there's a ton of middlemen and in china in general i feel like there's oftentimes a small group or even one person that has money and a massive amount of underlings that are just following him everywhere, doing everything for him and trying to, you know, get, get some of that, that trickle down money. What, what, okay. So it's such a, you know, shady business. It's volatile. What do you, what do you like about it? Uh, it's basketball. Yeah. It's basketball. It's fun. Uh, Chinese people love it. I mean, we come out to these cities, man, and sometimes, like I said, you know, we're playing in a game in the middle of nowhere, and there's 20,000 people watching our games, and they're going nuts. It's it's awesome, and, you know, people, n- not that I have any interest in being a celebrity, but, you know, there's people after the games just taking pictures with us, super excited. You, man. I'm trying to blow up. <laughs> I'm trying to blow up. Why do you think I'm doing this podcast? Do you think it's about Source by Nation? <laughs> Putting my face on everything. Putting my face on everything. <laughs> So that that part I love, you know, just people are super into it. They love basketball. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm getting old. I'm getting every year. I'm, I'm not as good as the years before. So, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this much longer, being able to, to make some money and go out to these places with my friends and, and play basketball. And it's all expenses paid. You don't have to pay for anything. So it's, I like it. It's fun. What is the, what is a crazy story that you could tell from from basketball like man when we were talking about getting this podcast together i really wanted to bring some of the other guys on you know some of the other players so that we could just kind of go back and forth because i feel like once i hear this guy's story i'll think of another story mm-hmm. um i remember i remember um the summer last year maybe it was like june or maybe just before summer like may you're telling me in a situation where you had a team out in another city and then you had to say to them that they weren't going to pay, they weren't going to play unless they got paid because I guess they didn't get paid for three games. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, that that's that's common. Well, not anymore, yeah. but at the time, you know, they told me, I, I usually arrange, hey, you got to pay, pay us before we play if I don't know the person, if I've never worked with them. And some people say, yeah, 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 no problem, no problem, no problem. That's very common in China. Hey guys, uh, you gotta be downstairs at 7.30, you know, game's at 8, game's at 8, big game tonight, big game. And I kept on telling the guys, I listen man, you know, nobody's, nobody's leaving until we get paid. That's, that's the way it goes. That's the situation. And, you know, some of these guys, some of the, the Chinese agents, they'll try to, uh, they'll try to call your bluff. So, um, you know, they had no intention of paying the team. And I actually wasn't there. I was handling all of this on the phone. And I got the entire team. And this was one of these games out in the middle of nowhere. And they had a giant stadium. And there was, you know, 25,000 people waiting for this game. And I just had to sit in at the hotel. I got all the guys to sit there and just sit around. 
and they probably pushed the game back till 9 p.m. because the guys thought that we were we were bluffing. And yeah, I just told everybody, nobody's moving until we get the we get what was agreed upon. And then eventually, they they came up with the money. It's so crazy. I just, I just, it's like from a logical perspective, I just don't understand why they would even bother waiting twelve hours or whatever it might have been to pay. It's like, well, they weren't. That was the they thing. I, they, they, they they weren't going to pay. They, they weren't going to pay, or they were going to see if we won first yeah. before they made a commitment to pay. So you know. Only reason why I know that is because I've gotten burned so many times initially. So now I know, you know, what, what it is to look for out here. But the crazy stories, I mean, they don't stop with just, just the money and the shady agents. I mean, we've had games where, you know, the refs are absolutely bought and paid for and we'll have five fouls and, and uh, for us and two free throws the entire game. And the other team will have like, there'll be like 40 fouls against us, literally. And they'll shoot 40 free throws. It's just out of control. Just the refs are so blatant, absolutely bought and paid for. Uh, sometimes we play in the, in the way up north in the winter. So it's like, it's like 10 degrees out. It's like freezing. And these guys are playing in hats and beanies and, and hooded sweatshirts. And the only thing exposed is their fingers. And yet there's still 10,000 people out watching the game. That's kind of crazy. Sometimes we play on terrible courts where it's like slick and nobody can run. And people are fucking busting their head on the floor when they're running. Just madness. Madness. We've had that. We've, I've, I've seen, I've seen out of control fights. A um, couple of the foreigners here have a bad rep, and they're hotheads, and they they start fights with people. I've seen I've seen bench clearing brawls with with Chinese teams. Um, I've seen it all out here, man. What's I mean, you're talking about like fights and th- things like that? You know, you're going to these tiny cities. What about the cultural differences between you know some dude from the states who's never traveled before and then he comes to china and he's in the middle of nowhere and the food is horrible and they're sh- staying in a shitty hotel um you know i, I think you're talking about something about uh, one agent was like tell them that we can't dry their clothes so quickly or something. I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I had one of the agents fly down to meet me and he's like i really want to work with you because i want you know to do the business but i can't take care of these guys it's just i I don't understand they always need their clothes washed (laughs) he just couldn't understand why when when they're out in these small cities like why wouldn't they just wash the clothes themselves in the in the sink but you know for for guys that are are used to playing ball and 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 playing in, in different countries the idea of you know hand washing your disgusting clothes in a tiny little sink in a in a dingy stinky hotel in the middle of nowhere is not attractive so yeah i mean i mean for the guys that just come out here it's um it's a big culture shock a lot of people can't handle it and they don't come back but you know one thing is uh the money's good for the, for this level of basketball it's not the top tier it's kind of like the second second or third tier you know as far as pro jobs all over the world are concerned and you know it's good money and it's consistent work and there's a lot of opportunities and you don't have to practice every day, you know, and you don't have all these rules and stipulations that a team provides you. You're just kind of like a freelance Mm -hmm. and you're rolling around wherever and, and you can make some, some, some decent money. And then on your off time, you can live in a city like Guangzhou or Shenzhen or Beijing and have, have a nice little life. You know, what makes the difference between a successful um, American or foreign basketball player in China and you know the ones that fail uh, I would say uh, I, I think you have to split it in two and I think they're equally as, as important uh, first is the style of basketball you play um, you have to have a certain type of game and you have to play a certain type of way to be successful to be really successful in China you have to be able to score you have to be able to um, score with the ball in your hands. I think I think that's really important. Otherwise, you're just going to be a role player. And, and Chinese people, if if they're paying you big money, they expect you to do monster things. But then, equally important is just uh, the type of personality you have, and being patient, and um, you know, not having so many requests, and constantly being rude and telling people what to do. Some of these guys, they're they're jerks, man. They just they just think they 
everything should be owed to them and other guys are not you know and those guys are just able to to roll with the punches and you know just deal with with the nonsense a little better you know what I mean I think I think that's a huge huge part of it some of the guys don't handle it well they get frustrated they don't understand what what's going on or they don't like it or they're flipping out because they don't want Chinese food anymore like take me to Pizza Hut you know like those guys oftentimes don't get invited back you ever like fly in food or just carry food from another like you know for, for carry some foreign food with you to the small cities like yeah usually you know some of the guys who are smart they try to snack up you know bring oatmeal bring granola bars you know bring whatever they can just bring a bucket of kfc yeah i mean they usually you find kfc or, or what they call daikos it's like the the fast food joint in these tiny tiny little villages it's daikos sometimes sometimes you just get dicosed out though man you know there's only only so many buckets of chicken you can eat in a, over a week period biggest difference between chinese basketball players and, and american basketball players um just like toughness intensity and toughness um i've played against a large number of chinese guys who by all means are better basketball players than me um bigger more athletic better skills much better shooters i'm not a great shooter um uh, handle the ball better than me just they're better basketball players than me head to toe but they can't beat me because i want to win more than them and you know in basketball terms like i'll, I'll just i'll take their heart man like like and that and that's a part about american basketball that I think still stands out to to the rest of the world is just the the amount of passion and heart that people play with and just the will to win man you know and I think that's still uh lacking in China because of the the basketball system that's in place here future state of not future state of basketball but the future of, of wall ball for you for me, uh, I'm gonna ride it out till the wheels fall off, man. It's fun. It's fun. And, and I don't think it's gonna last forever. You know, most people that play and are out here see that. Uh, I think basketball will continue to grow in China and it'll continue to, to be more, more popular and, and there'll be more and more opportunities here. But I don't, I don't see it on the wild ball level. Um, you know, I think a lot of these games were highly centered around, um, money laundering and maybe gambling at one point and that's no longer the case it's it's more organized and more um you know city money that's going into these games like like functions for for the village or the city and i think there's less money being tossed around for it and um you know plus with the influx of of foreign players um there's a lot of of competition out there number one and then two you know i see less and less opportunities for for foreigners as well because people want the locals to play they want to see their friends play so i think uh i think it's a dying thing but you know it's still it's still a cash cow and there's still a lot of uh opportunities to be had in the meantime is it dying or is it just becoming more of a business um it's always been a business. That's one thing I learned. Whether I knew it or not, it's always been a business. But it's it's slowing down. It's definitely on the decline compared to, to two or three years ago. Okay. All right. Sucks for you guys. <laughs> You're going to play basketball for the rest of your life. Um, I think we can end it there. We'll, we'll probably do like like you want to do you want to bring in a couple people to do the podcast yeah i'd love to to be with a couple guys who have been out here playing just kind of rift on some of the crazy stories that we've seen you know some of these guys have played in shopping malls some of these guys have played like in the absolute middle of nowhere and just i I think we could could make some really really funny and interesting stories off off of our shared experiences out here all right, people, it's the end of the podcast. If you want to uh, see, uh, listen to other episodes, you need to go to sourcefindasia.com slash made in China. Um, if you want to reach out to us, that's info at sourcefindasia.com, info at sourcefindasia.com. Uh, Facebook, sourcefindasia, Instagram at sourcefindasia. And uh, see you guys next time. Bye. 